I've been praying earnestly for you. We, um, we've had some really unusual attacks of the enemy inside our church family in just recent days. And, uh, and when, you, when you take that and you combine that with uh, what we've been walking through since March, it's, it's really, it's really it, you realize we really are under attack. But you know, there's this interesting thing that you will see if you look carefully in history. And that is in the worst times, God seems to make his greatest visitations. In the darkest moments, when things seem like they are very bad, is when God does his greatest work. But there's an interesting conundrum. The majority seem to miss it. Hear, hear this again. In the worst times, God seems to make his greatest visitations. In the darkest moments when things are very bad, that is when God seems to do his greatest work. Yet, the majority miss it. I'll give you some examples. So the children of Israel are delivered out of Egyptian slavery... They crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. Now imagine a million and a half people crossing the Red Sea on dry ground. But when the Egyptian army follows them, the Egyptian army is drowned. Now, I'm going to pause here because there are theologians and historians who will tell you the Israelites didn't cross at the Red Sea. They crossed at the Reed Sea, R-E-E-D, Reed Sea, which is only about knee deep. And I kind of agree with others. They go, well, that's an even greater miracle because the entire Egyptian army and their chariots and horses were drowned in knee deep water. They cross the Red Sea. They're on the other side of the Red Sea. They get manna from heaven. They get water from a rock. Their shoes don't wear out. Their clothes don't wear out. But only two from that entire generation made it into the promised land. That's, you know, that's not very good odds. Two out of a million and a half people. What, what, what's with the others? Why couldn't they see? Why couldn't they see? They still had way too much Egyptian slavery in their heart and in their brain. They couldn't see God. You know? Another illustration. I'm going to move it up a little, a little more contemporary. Okay? At the turn of the 20th century. The great Pentecostal outpouring across, around the world, actually. But probably the two places that are most noted, Azusa Street in L.A. and then in the hills of Tennessee. This great Pentecostal outpouring that, that was preparing the world for the war to end all wars. Because you had the Pentecostal outpouring also happening in Wales. It was also happening in Korea. I mean, you, you read the amazing revivals that was happening in Korea and in Wales at that same time. I mean, the world was literally being shaken by a mighty move of Almighty God. And yet the world was plummeted in to World War I because the majority missed it. How many here are old enough to remember the front page of Time magazine 
God is dead. You remember that in the 1960s, God is dead? There's two of us, three of us, four. The rest of you are too ashamed to admit how old you are. <laughs> God is dead. The writings of, uh, um, of the Enlightenment had just swept across this nation. And our, our nation was totally entering into a time of, of rejection of Almighty God. We'd remove prayer from the schools, Bible reading from the schools. And, and now this whole theory of postmodernism was being embraced and uh, LSD had, had hit the nation. Drugs were hitting the nation. The flower children, the hippie, the, the whole hippie movement. And into the midst of that came the Jesus people movement and the charismatic renewal that swept across this nation. And yet the majority missed it. The majority missed it. Leading us into not just postmodernism, but now post Christian. And now, not just post-Christian, anti-Christian. And as our culture has moved more and more pagan, as we've thrown God out, our culture has become so sexualized, the covenant of marriage is mocked. We murder our pre-born children by the millions of, 65 million lives are not with us today since Roe v. Wade in 1973. 65 million. Don't you wonder what genius we're missing? What miracle of medicine we're missing? If we've missed another Mozart, Beethoven, or Rembrandt, Maybe the next Dr. Billy Graham has been lost. It's amazing. We, we can't imagine. One of the reasons that our social security system and, and other systems are in such deep trouble is because we have 65 million missing. We don't think about it. That as our nation has moved that way and we've gone into this deep darkness. And now we're living with this plague that seems to have this ability to morph and change in moments. Where it normally takes viruses decades to morph. This one just morphs overnight changes and you wonder what's happening and now our nation is in this upheaval but folks i want to tell you it's moving the direction that that i shared with you three or four weeks ago watch it's going to become more and more anti-christian and we're watching that happen do you see do you see that instagram now is is calling christian worship dangerous and should be removed shouldn't be out in public Sean King, one of the leaders in the Black Lives Matter, sent out a text on June 22nd at 10.07 a.m. This was the words of that text. Yes, I think the, the statues of the white European they claim is Jesus should come down. They are a form of white supremacy. Always have been. In the Bible, when the family of Jesus wanted to hide and blend in, guess where they went? Egypt, not Denmark. Tear them down. Yes, all murals and stained glass windows of white Jesus and his European mother and their white friends should all come down. They are a gross form white supremacy created as tools of oppression, racist propaganda. They should all come down. Oh, we're living in a day of darkness. That into this dark space, 
and into this satanic upheaval, God wants to do something. In fact, he's up to something. I believe he's wanting to make his greatest visitation to this generation right now. See, I, I remember in high school, the Watts riots, the protests, the sit-ins. They called them sit-ins. College students would, go, would invade the college administration building and refuse to leave. And they would be, police were carrying them out. The whole Kent State affair, the shooting. I remember all of that like it was yesterday. I remember this upheaval. And our nation wondering, what is, what is happening? And right into the midst of that, on the beaches of California, exploded this Jesus people movement. And, and at Duquesne University in the East Coast, exploded the charismatic renewal, that leapfrog from Duquesne University to Notre Dame University to Michigan State University. And it swept out across the nation. Businessmen was the full gospel businessmen was born, and, and uh, the, uh, the women's aglow was born, and, and, and there was just, it was just this moving, sweeping across the nation. Billy Graham began holding some crusades for young people. The whole thing that took place in Dallas that gave birth to the fellowship of Christian athletes. The great move of God that was happening on the college camp. There was this sweeping of Almighty God in the midst of that dark hour. And I'm saying to you right now, church, God is wanting to do His greatest move in this generation right at this moment. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. And the enemy is trying to shut it down. Not on my watch. I will not act out of fear. So what do we do? What do we do in this? I think we have another example from the life of Elijah. Two weeks ago, we looked at the life of Elijah when he confronted the pagan sexualized culture of Israel up Mount Carmel. And that Sunday, you made covenant with Almighty God. You made a commitment in the altars, at your chairs. You made a commitment all over this room, receiving communion. You made a commitment that you were going to open your life to Almighty God and let Him expose any of the pagan culture that had attached itself to you and, and for it to be cleansed and to be purged so that you could be a sold out man and woman of God. Last week, we made a commitment that we would be a church family that would embrace a biblical perspective of the human race and people of color, and that we would accept the biblical mandate that we all have the same Father twice. Heavenly Father created us in the womb, and Heavenly Father made us a new creation at new birth by the Holy Spirit. So we all have the same parent, regardless of our color. We all have the same parent, Heavenly Father. Now we all have the same blood. Though our DNA is different, so that our skin pigment may be different. Some of our physical features may be different. But the scripture says we are all of the same blood. And though our cultures are different, the black culture, the Hispanic culture, I don't know what to call my culture because I'm Heinz 57. <laughs> but our cultures are different. Not wrong, just different. But you know what? That doesn't mean that they're not my brother, they're not my sister. Come on, amen? Amen. And we made a commitment that we are going to look at each other as family. We're brothers, we're sisters. There may be times we disagree because family members disagree. But I want to tell you, when it gets tough, the brother fights for the brother. Come on, amen? We stand together. We're going to love one another. We're going to embrace one. We made that commitment. 
that we're going to accept not the cultural view right now that's being propagated, but we're going to embrace the biblical view that gives us the right heart because we love with God kind of love. We're going to love exactly as Jesus loved. Come on, as he said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one for another. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Amen. So skin pigment doesn't change it. Culture doesn't change it. Even though I can't do hip-hop culture because I just my body doesn't do hip-hop. <laughs> but I don't have to do hip-hop to love you and embrace you. Right. Amen? Amen? Just like you may be black or Hispanic and I'm not expecting you to love Bill Gaither. We made a commitment. Today we're going to take that commitment a step further. Because here's what happened. So Elijah confronts the 450 prophets of Baal and the 450 prophets of Astarte. And he executes them. And he confronts Israel and says, look, if Baal is God, serve him. If the Almighty God is God, then serve Him. But you can't stand straddling this any longer. you got to make a decision. Who are you going to serve? And we made that commitment, just, just as Joshua did. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> he did that. Ahab goes home to Jezebel, and he says to her, Honey, you're not going to believe what happened today. And he told her the whole story of what happened at Mount Carmel. Now, that tells us two things. One, she wasn't there. And number two, she wore the pants of the family. And when he told her, she got furious. And she sent a messenger to Elijah and said, by this time tomorrow, you will be dead. Elijah, what's he going to do? He's confronted with that situation. And she has the power and the resources to do it. Because even though Ahab is king, she's the queen mother and she is the ruler. Just read, just read 1 Kings and you'll see what I'm talking about. She has the power and resources to do it. Because she's already had other people killed. One, because... One of the land, right? So what happens? Elijah runs. He flees. He flees. Now, look here. Here's Mount Carmel right here. This is the Jezreel Valley. This is where, where he's at. He flees. He runs all the way to Beersheba. Beersheba is right down here, the most southern city of Judah. So he flees the nation of Israel, goes into the nation of Judah, runs all the way to Beersheba, 100 miles. He flees 100 miles. Now, don't get, don't get too hard on him. He's exhausted. He's done what God called him to do. And now he's being threatened for doing what God called him to do. He's struggling with discouragement. He's struggling with fear because she, he knows she has the power and authority and the resources to have him executed. He's struggling with depression and he flees. Okay? <clears throat> but he goes to the right place. He flees to Beersheba, the well of oath. Beersheba is an important place. It's at Beersheba that Abraham went after he offered Isaac on the mountain to Almighty God. And God provided a ram. And God said, because you've obeyed me, I'm going to bless you. The place was called what? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. He comes from that mountaintop at Mount Moriah that we would know today as the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. He goes south to Beersheba, makes his residence at Beersheba, makes an altar and worships Almighty God. 
It's at Beersheba that Jacob encountered Almighty God face to face, and God promised him he was going to bless him. Beersheba, the place of oath. The place of oath. When he is under attack and he's struggling with discouragement and he's struggling with with depression, he runs to the place of oath. And I want to say to you, when you, you, you very well may have come under attack over the last three weeks. We've made some deep commitments to Almighty God over the last three weeks. You may have come under attack. You may have come under attack, but I want you to understand something. Run to the place where you've made your oath. Get in a place and remind yourself. Remind yourself of how you gave your life to Jesus Christ. Remind yourself of how Jesus saved you. There are times when I'm really, really under attack. I go back and and I just rehearse in my mind how I ended up going to that youth camp at 16. And how? truly believing that I was an unlovable human being and having made a vow I would never cry again. That night, for the first time in years, I was bawling my eyes out as I encountered the love of God. I felt love for the first time since I was like five years old. Almighty God's love just covered me forgave my sin. I I like to remind myself of that. I I like to remind myself of times when I've had just strong, strong encounters with Almighty God. I remind myself, and I, I, I just rehearse those memories in my heart. But here's another thing I like to do when I come under attack. I remind myself of who I am. I am not that old guy. That guy doesn't live anymore. He was buried with Jesus Christ. I am a new creation. And as a new creation, I may have the same name, Forrest Dean Hackett Jr., but I want to tell you this Forrest Dean Hackett Jr. doesn't look anything like the one before he got saved. When I started going to church at 16, all the moms told their daughters they couldn't sit with me, and there was a good reason. I, there's not anyone in this room that would have wanted me for your friend. Monday when I picked up the van, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the ways we became acquainted with the van was one of my high school buddies. He and I became acquainted the summer going into the eighth grade. I was a custodian at a bank, and I went to clean that bank at 4.30 in the morning Monday through Friday, he was the paper boy that delivered the newspaper to the bank early in the morning. And we met each other, and then we discovered we both were going to be going to the same junior high. They were called junior highs then, not middle schools. And then that fall, we played on the same football team, and we played on the same football team all through our senior year, and we became buddies. We're still buddies. At our 10-year high school reunion, we got to talking with one another and found out both of us were in the ministry and we pointed a finger at one another and went, you? <laughs> <clears throat> but I was sharing with him. We had lunch together when I picked up the van. We had lunch together and Barry was with us. And he mentioned something about, about uh, my, my salvation. And I, and I began sharing my testimony. He looked at me and goes, I would never have believed that about you. I said, well, (laughs) well, thank God Jesus made a big change. What did Jesus do in you? What did Jesus do in you? See, he gave you a brand new identity. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Amen? Amen? A new creation. A new creation, your new creation gave you a new heart with a new identity. You're now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You once were the enemy of God, now you're a son and daughter of Almighty God. Amen. you got to remind yourself, when you are struggling with discouragement, when you're struggling with depression, you've got to rehearse in your heart and say it out loud. I am a new creation. That is not who I am. It's not who I am. I am a new creation. And... and Hallelujah, Elijah ran to Beersheba 
the well of oath where he met Almighty God. Now, this is the curious thing. So when he gets there, he leaves his, one of his co-workers there. He starts on his journey towards Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. That's going to be another 200-mile journey he's going to take. He's going to take a total of 300-mile journey in this. <clears throat> but he, he stops at a juniper tree. And the scripture says in 1 Kings 19, verse 5, an angel of the Lord came to him. Now, the next verse in verse 6, it says the angel of the Lord came to him. So I want you to understand, God didn't send Gabriel. God didn't send Michael. God sent pre-incarnate Jesus to Elijah. How do I know that? Well, Abraham, Jacob, Joshua, Gideon, Moses, all these guys had an encounter with the angel of the Lord pre-incarnate Jesus, a manifestation of Jesus before his virgin birth. Fifty-two times in the Old Testament, there are references to the angel of the Lord. This is one of them. And as he, as he meets, as he meets with Elijah, he helps Elijah go to sleep first. And he gets rest. And then he feeds him. In your discouragement, in your depression, Almighty God wants to give you rest. It says in Psalms, he gives his beloved sleep. And in that he says, why are you staying up and working day and night? He gives his beloved sleep. God wants you to have sleep. He doesn't want you up walking the floor all night. That's not of God. He doesn't want you worrying yourself to death. That's not of God. He wants to give you rest. And then he's going to supply. He's going to be your resource. He's going to be your resource. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Amen? Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. He knows you. He will meet you. He will, he will supply your need. Almighty God, you can count on him. <clears throat> you know, we should expect attacks. That's normal. Expect struggles. That's normal. Look. Fighting discouragement, fighting depression, fighting condemnation, fighting critical thoughts and judgmental things against you. Folks, that's normal Christian living. People think when they get saved, suddenly all that stuff's going to vanish away. Are you kidding me? Did the world get saved? No, you still, you still work among people that aren't saved yet. That means they're probably not going to be nice sometimes. We still live in a fallen world. We still live in a sin-crazed, sexualized culture that hates Christianity. So, of course, we're going to come under attack. Not only that, the devil's still alive and well. Now, hallelujah, the day is coming, and it may be soon, when God's going to deal with him finally and cast him into the lake of fire. But right now, we got to deal with him. And so we're going to face condemnation. We're going to face periods of discouragement. We're going to face times of depression. That's normal. Defeat is abnormal for a child of God. That's abnormal. So if you're struggling with discouragement for weeks on end and months on end, that's not normal. That means the enemy's got a gateway that he's plaguing you with, and you haven't learned how to cut him off. That's what I'm wanting you to learn this morning. I want you to learn the power that you have to cut him off and to not live in that discouragement and live that. Yeah, there's going to be times where you feel discouraged. That's just it. They're feelings of discouragement. 
feelings of discouragement. You can do something with your feelings. People ask me, say, well, I want to feel better, Pastor. I just feel down all the time. I said, God, God, get rid of the stinking thinking. God, you got to take out that old DVD you got in there and throw it away and put in a new DVD that has the Word of God in it that tells you who you are in Jesus. Come on. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. If I love Philippians 4.13, has been my life scripture for decades and decades. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Has the angel of the Lord come and visited you lately? Okay, let me go to a couple of other scriptures. You're looking at me like I have two heads. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 43. Would you read this with me, please? I think it's, the scripture is big enough. We all can read it. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Yeah. Yeah. Folks, listen, listen. The Almighty God that has the weight and knows how much Mount Everest weighs. The Almighty God that has all the stars numbered. He knows how many are out there, and He calls every one of them by name. That's Almighty God, but even more significant, He knows your name. And He says, you are mine. And because you are mine, when Jezebel rises up and says, this time tomorrow, you're dead. You're going to love this. You ready? Here's a little nugget. No extra charge. Jezebel. The name means, where is Baal? And I always go, well, did you lose him? You know. It's, it's. <laughs> Elijah. Compound. Eli. Semitic word for God. Yah, shortened for Yahweh. Eli Yah, we call him Elijah. Eli Yah. Eli Yah means God is Yah. God is Yahweh. My God is Yahweh. So you got Jezebel, who's wondering where is Baal, attacking. <laughs> My God is Yahweh. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Who do you think is going to win? Yeah. Yeah. Who's going to win? Where does Jesus live? Inside what? Inside you. Jesus lives in me. Jesus is the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is God. The angel of the Lord is pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was in the beginning, and he will still be there when everything comes to an end. He is before all things, and he will be existing after all things. Jesus Christ pre-existed the virgin birth. Jesus Christ is going to be the one sitting upon the throne when everything is wrapped up. Jesus Christ lives in me. He is Yah. He is Yahweh. He lives in me. So when this culture comes after me, when the enemy comes after me, when a curse comes after me, when condemnation comes after me, when, the, when I am threatened, I do not have to live in despair, in discouragement, in depression, because my God is Yah.
And he knows me by name. And he says, when they light a fire, they won't burn you. Just ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when you go through a flood, it won't drown you. Just ask Mo. And when the enemy surrounds you and says, I'm going to kill you, ask Hezekiah. Because when the Assyrian army, the Rabshakeh surrounded Jerusalem and said, what makes you think your God's big enough? We destroyed all the other cities and their gods. We'll get your God too. But my God, is Yah. And that night, the entire Assyrian army died. And the Rabshakeh went back to Damascus in fear of Almighty God. And my God has my back. My God has me. My God surrounds me. Well, I had a whole nother point about going to Mount Sinai, but we're going to look at that next week. I'm supposed to stop this right here because there are some of you, you have been struggling with depression and with discouragement. This whole thing about COVID has had you filled with fear, worry. Watching the news and what's gone on at Chaz and what's gone on in Portland, what's gone on across the nation has just got you in anxiety. And Almighty God wants you to know, I've got you. You don't fear any of this stuff. I've got you. I've got you. We don't live in fear. Team, come on up, please. Church family, would you just close your eyes for a moment? Play that song. You know the one I mean. Yeah. The one you had for the altar that we were singing. Yeah. I know I'm off camera. I'm stepping down here to be among the people. Love of God. Saturate this church family right now. Love of God. Saturate this church family. Love of God, saturate this church family. Love of God, soak them and saturate them. Love of God, soak them and saturate them. Love of God, love of God, love of God, love of God. Oh, love of God. Love of God, bring assurance. Love of God, bring assurance. Love of God, bring affirmation. Love of God, I pray that you would bring a feeling of security. Bring a feeling of acceptance. Lord, all of the negative emotion, all of the worry, all of the angst, all of the discouragement, all of the depression, in the authority of Jesus' name to be dispelled, and in the authority of Jesus' name, faith to rise, hope to rise, in the name of Jesus, feelings that, that they are secure, that they are anchored in Jesus. Father, I pray that knowledge, that assurance will fill their heart. And I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus right now, right now, right now. My God is Yah. He is Yahweh. He is Almighty God. He created the heavens and the earth. He created the earth upon the waters. He founded upon the waters. He measured out the foundations. 
He is the one that measured out every drop of water in the oceans and in the seas and told them where to stay. He is the one that has brought life into the fields. And so from each bare seed after its own kind, he is the one that created the animals and the birds and they bring after their own kind. And he is the one that created mankind in his own image. We are in his image. And now we are born again in his image. And we are his children. And he is our father. And he says, I will shelter you. I will protect you. I will guard you. I will be the one that goes before you. I will be your rear guard. I will surround you with my favor like a shield. I will cover you. I am your God. Father, thank you. Thank you. And we give you praise, Almighty God. Come on, give him praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 There is someone that desperately needs healing in their damaged emotions. From your childhood, you have been abused. And Almighty God wants you to know He was there. He didn't approve. He is surrounding you. His love affirms you. You can trust Him. You can trust Him. You can trust Him. Let Him heal your damaged emotions right now. Let His Spirit just fill you and bring healing to your damaged emotions. Come on, trust Him. He is a Father you can trust. He will not wound you. He will not hurt you. You can trust Him. He loves you. His love is pure. His love is holy. His love is healing. Let His love flood you right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, thank you for your healing ministry. Jesus, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing. There's a brother here. You are not stupid. You are not dumb. You are not a failure. You will amount to something. You will amount to something. Almighty God in you gives you the hope. And this is his word to you. I know you. I have called you by name. And I have a future and a hope for you. And I will give you that assurance and I will give you that strength. And I will give you the skill and the ability to move forward day by day. And I will give to you the healing and the affirmation you need in your heart if you will but trust me. That is God's word to you, sir. Open your heart to him, and you know exactly who I'm talking to. Open your heart to him right now. Open your heart to him right now. Let his spirit minister to you. Let his spirit minister to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Almighty God. In the prayer.